Commissioner, would you call the meeting to order? Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here. Uh, welcome to the uh, Joint Conference Committee for the Laguna Honda uh, Hospital and Rehab Center uh, for February 13th, 2024. Mr. Moritz, will you read the land acknowledgement? Sure, I will call a roll first. I'll start with you, Commissioner Guillermo. Present. Commissioner Green. Present. And Commissioner Chow. Present. All right, now I will read the land acknowledgement. The San Francisco Health Commission acknowledges that we are on the unceded ancestral homeland of the Ramantush Ohlone, who were the original inhabitants of the San Francisco Peninsula. As the indigenous stewards of this land and in accordance with their traditions, the Ramatosh Ohlone have never ceded, lost, nor forgotten their responsibilities as the caretakers of this place, as well as for all peoples who reside in their traditional territory. As guests, we recognize that we benefit from living and working on their traditional homeland. We wish to pay our respects by acknowledging the ancestors, elders, and relatives of the Ramatosh Ohlone community and by affirming their sovereign rights as first peoples. Thank you. Shall I go on? Yeah. Uh, I'll call the items. Yeah. Second item on the agenda is the approval of the January 9th, 2024 minutes. Okay, is there a motion to approve? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Uh, and folks, uh, if uh, there's two remote, uh, two folks who have received accommodation for remote public comment, please raise your hand if you'd like. Okay, I see the hand. Is there anyone in the room who'd like to make public comment on this item? We're on item two, the minutes? No. Okay, so I will, each of you will get three minutes. I've unmuted you, caller. Please let us know that you're there. I am Patrick. Or Mr. Monette Shaw, you've got three minutes. This is Patrick Monette Shaw, code AA. Because my voice is so hoarse and I'm unable to talk, as a reasonable accommodation, I am again using the Microsoft Windows feature called Read Aloud during this meeting to speak for me to ensure my oral testimony is recorded in the audio of this meeting. Unfortunately, I'm still having trouble with Windows changing the read aloud narrator's voice to a male voice, so the Windows voice used today is a standard default female voice. As for these particular meeting minutes and the meetings of all Health Commission and Commission subcommittee meetings, it's insulting that this Health Commission never meaningfully addresses legitimate questions raised by members of the public. We never get any meaningful follow-up answers from any of you commissioners. You seem to forget that members of the public are key stakeholders in Health Commission affairs. As you will hear in my testimony, damning evidence by a declaration recently filed in a Superior Court lawsuit involving Laguna Honda Hospital by an expert witness fingers this Health Commission for your many failures as the official governing body of the San Francisco Department of Public Health, and in particular as the governing body of Laguna Honda Hospital. I believe the comment is over and commissioners, um, I will do a, unless there's any further discussion, I will call, do a roll call vote. Commissioner Chow, how do you vote on this item? Yes. Uh, Commissioner Guillermo? Yes. And Commissioner Green? Yes. All right, thank you. The minutes are approved. We can move on to item three, which is general public comment. Uh, we see the same hand. Mr. Minette Chow, do you have a general public comment? I believe you do. You're unmuted. Should Tommy Thompson Superior Court case, CPS 20-517064, prevail eventually forcing this commission to approve another settlement agreement, you must read the damning indictment of this commission in the 68-page expert witness Christopher Cherney's declaration supporting making the Thompson lawsuit a class action case during a May 24, 2024 hearing. Cherney's declaration exposes as I previously documented, this commission's abject failures as SFBPH's governing body. It's searing, sad reading. Cherney addresses this commission's failures adopting the deficient 2019 60-day LHH turnaround plan authored by Greg Colfax and Troy Williams as a plan of correction, the 2019 immediate jeopardy citation patient sex abuse scandal under LHH's then-CEO Mimic Hirose's failed leadership. Cherney Finger's 2019 commissioners Edward Chow, Cecilia Chung, Lori Green, and Tessie Guillermo for collective oversight failures as LHH's governing body during that scandal that led directly to LHH's eventual decertification and halt of all admissions. Your time is up. Until 2020. All right, commissioners, that's the only uh, public comment. 
uh, during general public comment. So we can move on to item four, which is the executive team report. And I will run the slides. Give me one second to pull them up, please. Just let me know when you need to um, progress. So it'll be you, Mr. Pickens. Yes. That's okay. Ready whenever you are. Good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, Roland Pickens, uh, director of the San Francisco Health Network. Could everyone please mute themselves if you're not speaking? But we're hearing some uh, very loud kind of ancillary noise. Thank you. So again, good uh, afternoon, commissioners. Uh, Roland Pickens, director of the San Francisco Health Network and executive sponsor of the Laguna Honda recertification um, process. I'm joined here in the room uh, with our Laguna Honda chief executive officer and nursing home administrator, Sandra Simon. And we're also joined by members of the executive team uh, and other leaders who will be making parts of this presentation and available for any questions or, or comments. Next slide. So we are sharing with you um, that uh, the same um, update that we gave, um, very similar to our last um, meeting, we completed the reasonable assurance period for Medicare recertification. Uh, we uh, had, you recall, our Medicare survey back in January, uh, December, and that showed significant improvement prior to, from prior CMS monitoring surveys with overall less findings and findings of lower scope and severity. Uh, as required, we submitted a robust plan of correction uh, that was reviewed uh, by our quality improvement expert. Um, there were two components to that plan of correction. The fire life safety portion was submitted on January the 13th. The health monitoring portion was submitted on Wednesday, January 17th. Those were all submitted to the California Department of Public Health. Uh, it's our understanding that the California Department of Public Health uh, has now forwarded that submission to the Federal Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, and we are awaiting uh, further communication from them as to whether or not there need to be changes to that plan of correction or if they accept it uh, as received. Next, next slide. So, um, as has been for the last two years, recertification uh, in the Medicare program remains our pr primary and current goal. Uh, as I just said, we are still not yet recertified in the Medicare program, although we were, as you know, successfully recertified in the Medicaid program um, uh, late last year. Uh, in terms of what the process is, as I said, we've submitted the plan of correction. Um, we are awaiting feedback from CMS through the California Department of Public Health in terms of uh, whether or not they will accept that plan as written or require changes. And then after they do the acceptance, then there will be a period for them to actually validate that we have completed all the steps in that plan of correction. So again, we are at this point in a holding pattern awaiting that further communication from CMS. However, um, we have actually completed many of the items that we submitted to them so that if and when they do approve that plan and are coming for validation, uh, we uh, all have all of the information ready to show them our compliance with that plan of correction. Next slide. So we'd like to provide uh, an update on the status of uh, individuals uh, at Laguna Honda who no longer require skilled nursing care. We have an team that's been active for the last two years working on uh, this particular group. Um, as you can imagine, individuals who, when they first entered Laguna Honda, actually had a need and met the criteria for skilled nursing care. Uh, over that time, they received services uh, to the extent that um, they no longer have that need and no longer meet uh, the federal requirements for reimbursement for skilled nursing care. Oftentimes, these individuals have uh, co-occurring conditions, uh, mental health and or substance use, and also some phys uh, physical challenges uh, that make um, identifying an appropriate community-based uh, site for discharge uh, often very difficult and complex to arrange and coordinate with other agencies. But again, we have both our Laguna Honda, Department of Public Health, 
Department of Homeless and Supportive Housing, our Human Services Agency, all working to identify, and the placement team in our Behavioral Health Department, all working to identify appropriate uh, discharge locations for these individuals. You'll recall that in um, April of last year, we were directed by the Federal Department of Health and Human Services uh, to begin to uh, discharge those individuals who no longer have skilled nursing level of care. Since April of last year, a total of 21 uh, residents uh, in that category have been discharged. And as of today, there currently are in-house 45 residents who no longer meet skilled nursing level of care. Next slide. And um, sharing with you our most recent admissions discharge and expiration data. Uh, obviously, we've had no admissions. We are still under the hold on admissions um, pending our recertification back into the Medicare program. And as for the month of January, the average daily census at Laguna Honda was 449. Next slide. And just would like to share with you uh, just some recent uh, activity. Uh, as you know, we ex experienced uh, severe storms in the area of the last few weeks. Uh, as a result, uh, we activated the nursing home incident command system on Sunday, February 9th, due to a PG&E power outage. Uh, all backup infrastructures, such as generators, worked successfully as they were designed. Uh, there was no disruption to services and residents remained stable for the duration of the power outage. Our facilities department and the city department of public works completed removal of down trees of which there were several on the campus. Mm -hmm. A special thanks to our staff for their response and supporting the residents during the storm and the Hicks activation. Next slide. That concludes my portion of the report and we'll be happy to uh, take questions at the appropriate time from the commission. Thank you, Mr. Pickett. Uh, are there public comments or questions from the public? Yes, um, please give me one second to refresh the public comment thing so I can see. Great. We have two hands up. Caller of Ivan Mutaji, please let us know that you're there. Hi, uh, this is Dr. Palmer BB. Um, I have questions about um, how, um, what the period of validation will um, mean and how long that usually takes uh, if anyone has any experience with this. I also question why um, for months um, so few patients have been discharged. And um, I worry that um, budget cutting uh, the budget situation is making that worse. And um, I'd like more questions answered as to um, why there are specific problems in treatment. Are these people that need out of county um, uh, involuntary mental health care? Are they um, medically complex? It'd be nice to have some kind of breakdown uh, to um, clarify what kind of services aren't available that should be available in county for these patients. Um, and uh, um, I would like um, some idea of um, if there have been any negotiations at all with the state about the plan of correction um, or just really complete silence. Um, thanks a lot. Thank you. And we've got one more. Mr. Manette Shaw, you uh, have three minutes. This is Patrick's computer again speaking for Patrick Monette Shaw. It's worrisome CMS slash CDPH haven't approved the plans of correction, POC, submitted following the health inspection survey component conducted between November 27, 2023 and December 1, 2023 that LHH claimed was to have been an unusual second Medicare recertification survey. Why haven't they approved it yet? If they have asked for revisions to the POC submitted, you should members of the public that you had to revise a deficient POC. Why hasn't Congresswoman Pelosi in San Francisco
In four, Congressional delegation intervened with Secretary Becerra to speed up LHH's recertification. How long does LHH and this JCC think it will take CMS to so-called validate completion of a revised POC? And how long does LHH and this JCC anticipate it will take for CMS slash CDPH to then make a final determination on recertifying LHH into the Medicare reimbursement program so that admission which have now been halted for 60 days short of a full two-year period, can resume? Why hasn't LHH assured the long-term sustainability yet of the corrective actions it has been making with the assistance of a consultant and QIE brought in in May 2022 to get LHH back into regulatory compliance? Thank you. All right, that item. public comment. Okay, thank you. Are there questions or comments from members? None? Oh. Okay. Uh, Dr. Chow. Uh, yes, thank you. Can you hear me? I just want to be sure. Yes. Oh, thank you. Um, I, I did have uh, several questions. I thought uh, uh, the presentation uh, was very nice, uh, Dr. Pickens, um, or Mr. Pickens. I, I, well, at this point, we should really, you know, uh, confer upon you a new degree. <laughs> Or, uh, for the hard work over these last two years. But uh, uh, could you tell me the experience we've had with the validation period of time? I mean, we've had a number of uh, surveys by CMS. So uh, maybe that could help us give a time frame. I mean, we recognize maybe for several weeks the state sort of went over, apparently didn't comment to you any uh, needs, and then moved it to CMS. So. Uh, could you help us with this uh, time frame? Sure, I'll start and then we'll ask um, our Director of Regulatory Affairs, Nas Talai, to, to uh, opine if I miss anything important. So the validation process uh, is not uh, something that's new to us. It's part of the regular uh, survey process. Uh, we received the 2567 Statement of Deficiencies. We uh, developed and submitted the plan of correction. Uh, we are waiting for approval of that plan. And then uh, as we have done with every other survey, once that plan is approved, then the validation comes. The validation can come in many different forms, primarily either through an offsite document review uh, and or an onsite validation survey where surveyors actually show up and may still ask for documents, but then may also go to the floors again to see uh, the actual imp implementation of those corrective actions. Uh, that can go anywhere from a few days to a week or more. Uh, so it just depends upon how the regulatory agency decides to conduct the validation in the manner that they feel will give them their level of comfort that we have corrected all of those deficiencies. You got it all rolling. Thank you. Right. Do you uh, uh, so, so so in in terms of the timing at this point, uh, do we feel that there's un well, well, of course, every day is sort of an undue delay, but that uh, this is within the normal uh, workings of DPH and CMS, uh, or that uh, I, I know one time it took several months right before they they gave you back your response. Mm -hmm. Uh, great question. I'll, I'll uh, ask Nas to uh, provide an answer. Sure, no problem. Uh, good afternoon, Commissioner Chow. I would say that currently we're, we're still in a reasonable window. Um, for this particular review, we submitted, we being Laguna Honda, submitted a number of documents to show the amount of work that we have done. And so they're continuing to review that information. Uh, okay, very good. Uh, could I ask one more question, which is actually in relation to uh, the number of people that we have uh, been able to uh, discharge, uh, uh, Mr. Prickens, uh, have most of those been able to be placed into, or all of them into uh, facilities and uh, a location that they felt comfortable with? Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Chow, for that question. Um, I would say yes, the answer to that is yes. Part of our discharge process actually involves a uh, check-in once the individual is discharged 
uh, out of Laguna. Uh, our social workers actually follow up to check on their status to make sure that they are doing well uh, in their placements. And I can actually give you a little bit more information in terms of um, the places where those individuals went in terms of types of service. So you recall there have been a total of 22 that have been discharged so far. And they are rep very much representative of those 45 who still remain on the list. Of those 22, uh, one resident was discharged uh, to coordinated entry housing through the city. Um, 11, the greatest number, went to board and care settings. So that is the greatest need. Five residents went to scattered uh, site housing. Uh, one resident was discharged uh, initially to um, a hotel and then progressed on to other permanent housing. Two residents were discharged to their homes or the homes of family. And two uh, residents um, were discharged to um, uh, internal network uh, programs like uh, medical uh, respite. Very good. So, so I think this shows the difficulty, right, that we all had in the beginning when we were told to discharge uh, hundreds of people. Uh, and, uh, and this is now with the work of both the state and, and our partners trying to find adequate uh, uh, sites for the uh, non uh, SNF uh, qualified patients, right? So, uh, want to thank you for um, uh, following up on them, and that uh, it sounds like uh, uh, this uh, more deliberate course is helpful for our client uh, for our patients who now have uh, been able to uh, move out of institution. So. Uh, uh, we'll look forward, if we can, to continue follow up uh, on the uh, progress of moving uh, our other uh, non SNF qualified members. So, thank you. Yes, yeah, thank you for the presentation. There was something you said I, I may have misunderstood. So, the CDPH has reviewed everything we've submitted and then they've forwarded to CMS. Do we have any sense for how often CMS would come back and say, you know, we disagree or we want more than what the Department of Public Health has reviewed, obviously, thoughtfully and carefully? Great question. And our experience for the last two years has been that they almost always come back and say, we either don't agree or we don't understand. Please clarify. Please say this rather than that or change this. And so we fully anticipate uh, that kind of response from them and just are just anxiously waiting to, to get that uh, that response. And what what's the longest we've had to wait? And, and given that this whole reevaluation of skilled nursing facilities has been a governmental uh, priority recently, is there any sense that it might take longer because there's more institutions throughout the country that are being evaluated by CMS? Do we have any way of gauging in terms of, of how long we might have to wait? Are there any clues? Uh, again, I'll ask Nas. She's, a little, she's uh, our Director of Quality and Regulatory Affairs. She has more expertise in that uh, area and more uh, up-to-date uh, data. No problem. Commissioner Green, do you mind repeating your question for me, please? Oh, I was just wondering, you know, what's the longest we've had to wait um, and what whether there there is any worry that as the government is uh, reevaluating skilled nursing facilities throughout the country that might, we might be waiting in line just as we were trying to get our um, our fries cleared and there's been such a backlog there um, of course that's CDPH but I'm wondering if there's any mm -hmm. any um, indicators that might help us we're all so eager to see the, to move on and to readmit you know our individuals who were were sent out at the beginning and everyone I think the public especially is very anxious to have any clues we can have so we, we can have some reassurance. Yes, absolutely. And thank you so much for um, restating that for me. So what I what I do know and can share is that th there is not a set timeline, right? It, it really depends on how urgent the matter is perceived to be from CMS and CDPH. With that being said, I think that the recertification of Laguna Honda Hospital is a top priority for both CMS and CDPH, uh, and that there are many leaders all over who are invested in ensuring that happens in a, a timely fashion. 
Um, so, you know, given that we submitted our uh, plan of correction in mid January, we then followed up with su supporting evidence um, and quite a number of supporting evidence and have been in dialogue. I do, I am confident that we're actively reviewing our information at the CDPH side, and then of course they need to communicate with CMS. Um, you know, the, the only kind of indicator in regards to delays or processes from CMS and CDPH are related to acute surveys. They have indicated um, late last year that their hope is to restart acute surveys this year, and they don't know um, when or how that will look like, and it will impact most hospitals. So at some point, Laguna will be part of that, as you know, with our acute license. Um, but that's the only delay that they've kind of communicated in their review process. Thank, thank you very much. And, you know, on um, discharging individuals that no longer qualify for Laguna, I know today there was a press release and it's more about active treatment beds, but not knowing much about about the politics, I guess the Board of Supervisors approved those beds, but is there anything going on um, at, at a Board of Supervisors or city level that would open more opportunities, or are we still dealing with the same issues that so many board and care homes have closed for a host of reasons, and that you know our repertoire of choices for discharging the residents is really not going to be significantly improved, regardless of, of the various initiatives that are going on within the city? I mean, where do we fit in all of that? So uh, what I am aware of is, you recall, um, we previously had the placement team that was part of the transitions division of the network. Uh, that, uh, right as COVID came, that division actually went away and that placement team moved to behavioral health services within the Department of Public Health. So they are responsible for and have the budget to secure those lower levels of care for our residents who need discharge. So for board and care or psychiatric stiff or other levels. Uh, I'm aware that uh, Director uh, 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 Hillary uh, Kunins and her staff are actively um, developing plans to secure additional beds uh, uh, at uh, primarily uh, sites within the city uh, and are looking at options in terms of how to more quickly bring those beds online uh, so that we will have more uh, of a supply to discharge into. Thank you. And then I guess the last question is, I know a lot of people are concerned about, you know, the priorities and especially bringing back residents who were discharged at the onset of all these, these problems. Are we doing anything now to at least track um, the individuals that we would want to come back first? Because I believe when we, um, you know, approve policies that absolutely the people who were discharged um, are priority to come back. But what about, uh, you know, efforts to track them? Because I think some members of public have the sense that, you know, we're, we're not doing anything until we are able to um, reinitiate admissions. But I wonder what's going on behind the scenes in terms of being able to act. Granted, you can't just bring 15 people or whatever it is in on day one, but I'm curious to know what kind of planning is underway. I think people have a lot of anxiety about that. Yes, I'll actually ask uh, our nursing home administrator, CEO, to uh, provide that answer as she and our new chief medical officer, Dr. Lamb, are leading that work uh, and that reach outreach to those previous residents as part of her work she's doing. So I'll ask her to come forward. Yes, um, can you, it's just about the admission process or the outreach to the former residents, is that your question? Um, so yeah, there is a team that is looking and preparing and planning and assessing the road to readmission for when we get recertified and there has been outreach to some of those, um, those residents. I can't give you the number off the top of my head, but I know there is contact and there are, are plans to bring folks back who would choose to come back. Does that it, it might be really helpful as you, you move along for a little presentation for us to get more granularity about how, how you're proceeding and what you're thinking um, and how you're tracking that. That would be really helpful because I, I think it is an issue the public is concerned about. And I think, you know, as we develop our plans to bring uh, former residents back, that may also inform how we 
manage future admissions as well. So I, I think everyone's really interested in that. And I'm sure there's a lot to go into it, including thinking about what is really doable and how many people can come at once. And obviously there's pent up demand all over the place. So it'd be very interesting to hear how these, how your thinking evolves and the plans evolve. Yeah, I would welcome the opportunity to come back and present that more information to you. Thank you. I see Dr. Lamb had put his camera on, so I'm wondering whether he had some additional comments to make. Yeah, no additional comments. Thank you for the invitation to share. Okay, great. Just wanted to make sure since I know I, whenever anybody turns their camera on, it, it looks like they're getting ready to add some comments or uh, such. So, but thank you. Did you have any additional? Okay, great. I did have one, um, one more question related to the remaining 45 uh, residents uh, that are waiting to be discharged. So we were directed by CMS to begin to discharge them. Are we, uh, um, because they're no longer qualified for uh, SNF level care, does that mean that we're not getting reimbursed for their service, for the services they're providing? So we are, we are, the cost is fully covered now by the, uh, the city and county. Is that the way that it's working? We should get an answer to you for, for, on that. Um, there may be some administration lower, just a basic rate, just, but we are not getting the traditional full payment for SNF for those individuals. But we'll ask our, fine, our budget team to clarify. The answer is either we're getting zero or we're just getting a small administrative fee uh, per day for those individuals. But we'll get back to you with a specific answer on that. Okay, uh, I'm just, um, uh, I don't know if there's equivalency here in terms of the cost of providing care to those individuals at Laguna Honda versus providing, you know, some subsidy for them uh, in order to be able to free up the beds at Laguna Honda, even if there were places uh, to place them. So it's just a calculation, again, given the budget considerations and the constraints that we're going to be under. Um, uh, it's a, it's it's something I think to think about, or at least to ask about. Uh, so great, that would be good to find out. Okay, thank you uh, very much for your report. I think we can move on. Great, thanks again. Uh, item five is the hiring and vacancy report. Good afternoon, commissioners. I'm happy to provide the vacancy report for um, January. LHH vacancies were at 13.8% in January, seeing an increase from the 127 in December. We hired a total of 25 employees between January 1st and January 31st in various classifications and had four separations during the same period, including one retirement. We continue to prioritize and support with the hiring of the RN class. The vacancy rate currently stands at 7.69%, um, which translates to 16.5 vacancies of these positions. We're currently processing five reassignments. We've made candidate selections for 10 of the remaining positions, and they've started the onboarding process as we speak today. With regards to the nursing managers 23-22 class, we're currently in the process of hiring for six of the vacant positions. The new eligibility list is uh, waited for this classification to begin the hiring process. Um, there are currently 27 openings for the licensed vocational nurses category or the 2312 class for which we've made selection for 19 positions between the time that you know I prepared this report and I presented today I'm happy to let the commissioners know that all the 19 candidates are now um, you know onboarding uh, so we've selected the candidates. We've begun the onboarding process with them. We have candidates being interviewed for six of the other vacancies, while two of the vacancies are just beginning the hiring process. Now with the certified nursing assistant category, we're currently seeing a vacancy of 
42 uh, positions in the classification. 18 of these are being processed for reassignment. 16 are in the selection process. Eight of these are beginning to, uh, you know, move into the hiring process soon. So, as I've been also been providing the update, we also have a central team that's processing vacancies within several classes through an efficient batch hiring process. We are beginning to onboard 50 new hires in the 2903 of the hospital eligibility worker classifications, seven in the 7334 of the stationary engineer classification, 15 of the 2593 of the health program coordinator classifications. We're also beginning the hiring process for 32 vacancies across DPH for the 2430 of the medical evaluation assistant classification. The batch hiring process continues to identify efficiencies by looking at vacancies across DPH and ensuring a better outcome for both the candidates and the hiring managers. The HR team continues to hold vacancy meetings with exec leaders and hiring managers on a weekly, monthly basis to both go over vacancy information, provide status updates on hiring of you know specific vacancies, and also to discuss and agree on hiring plans, etc. Aaron highlights for uh, last month five P one hundred three or as needed RNs started last month. One registered nurse started last month. Non RN highlights we had our 943 chief care experience officer start last month. Two 23 2232s or senior physician specialists started last month. One 2230 physician specialist started last month. And we also saw nine. 2303s or the patient care assistance start at LHH last month. Thank you. Um, is there a public comment on this? Okay. Yes, I've got two hands up. Uh, we'll take one at a time. Caller, you are unmuted. Please let us know that you're there. Hi, this is Dr. Palmer, BB, code BB again. Um, I, um, I, noticed that the hiring of multiple vacancies in home health aides is on hold. And I would like to know why um, thinking that Laguna Honda needs all hands on board to resume readmissions. And are the numbers of vacancy and the need for hiring based on the full um, 700 plus bed census? Since less than 450 residents remain, um, uh, it's unclear um, are you what the hiring goals are and when you're saying percentage of vacancies, what the ultimate goal is. Um, it, it seems like if you're not fully staffed, you're not going to be able to begin readmissions and this is concerning. And so how will vacant patient positions affect resumption of readmissions and how is um, how did the hiring numbers reflect this? Thank you. All right, thank you for your comment. We've got one more. All right, Mr. Manet Shaw, you have three minutes. Patrick Monet Shaw. The LHH vacancy report by FTE, full time equivalent carrying a title of December 2023, listing the vacancy rate of all LHH job classification code carries a run date. The data was collected as November 1st, 2023 to December 1st, 2023. Why wasn't the run date for the status of LHH vacancies at the end of January, 2024? The FTE report shows an overall vacancy rate throughout LHH at 13.99%, which should have been rounded up to an even 14%. As of December 1st, 2023, total LHH vacancies soared to 212.3. You have to wonder what LHH's total vacancies were as of January 31st, 2024, and why overall vacancies have climbed so high. The overall vacancy rate as of October 2023, run date ending October 2nd, 2023, was just 11.11%. 11 
That increased to an overall vacancy rate of 12.19% for the November 2023 vacancy report, run date through October 26, 2023, with a total of 180.91 total vacancies. So instead of a downward trend in overall vacancies, they continue to climb. Troublingly, the FTE vacancy report through December 1, 2023 shows that job class 2583 home health aid vacancies have climbed to 23 vacancies, representing a 37.7% vacancy rate. Job classification 2312 licensed vocational nurse vacancies have climbed to 27, representing a 24.77% vacancy rate. Job classification 2322 nurse manager vacancies have climbed to 7, representing a 25.93% vacancy rate. Why does LHH still have so many vacancies in the nursing department and such high vacancy rates? Thank you. All right, that's the last public comment. Okay. Are there any questions or comments from members of the committee? Commissioner Green. Yes, thank you for the report. I know you wrote an explanation, but I wonder if you can elaborate a little on this issue of our nurse managers, because it, you know, you do have a vacancy rate and it says that other nurse directors fill in. How many, how many nurse directors do we have? I, I guess my concern is that there's so much responsibility right now, especially as we do our plans of correction and leadership is trying to um, help all the employees do the best job they can. And yet, if you have to recruit some people with other responsibilities to fill in um, on, on the more new boots on the ground nurse manager um, positions, how are you really balancing all that? Because it's one thing to get registry to do um, you know, bedside care. It's another thing to have individuals who really can move all these initiatives forward, especially if we're understaffed. And then the correlate to that is, are any of our um, consultants that are, are still there, especially the, CC, the, the, the care at the bedside monitors, um, able to backfill some of this as you try to um, figure out how to manage the, the managerial positions? Hi, I'll try to answer that. So uh, I'll go in reverse order. So in, in terms of can any of the consultants like the CCBMs uh, participate, uh, the answer is no. Uh, as consultants, uh, they are not allowed to supervise or direct the work of city employed staff. So they are only there in a coaching, uh, education, uh, expertise um, uh, role. So they are unable to fill the role of a of a, a absent nurse manager, which is why then, um, and uh, I think Terry and Tony and our nursing leaders are on. I think believe we have like six nursing directors, and so uh, when there are vacancies in nurse managers, we we fill that by two primary means: either we see are there are there high functioning charge nurses who are willing and able to step up. Uh, to be at least an interim or an acting nurse manager until the vacancy is filled. And then we do it the other way. We look at our higher level nursing directors and say, we need you, the need is greater at the unit level, so we need you to step over and fill in this vacant nurse manager role until it gets filled. Is there any issue that the nurse managers and, and the um, charge nurses are in different unions? Um, well, they definitely are in different unions, um, and I, I can't speak for the unions, but, you know, typically one union does not see favorably to another union uh, engaging in the work of, uh, of their members. Thank you. Thank you. I, I had, oh, uh, Commissioner Chow, you had a question. Uh, yes, uh, I'm, I'm reading your report for February. And I'm trying to understand, it says in regard, uh, and it just happens to be also with some of the nursing managers, uh, it says that you're hiring six at this point uh, when we had, uh, what, a vacancy of seven or something? Uh -huh. so, so that means that uh, shortly we're going to fill all these positions. Is, am I reading that correctly? Yes. Yes. Okay, and then under the RN class, which right now you say we have 7.7% uh, uh, of vacancy or 16 and a half 
Uh, you found five reassignments and you are actually making candidate selections for 10. So that okay. just about fills the RN slot at this point. Yes. Right? yes. Barring retirements and so forth. Yes. So, so I am reading those correctly that you've done really a marvelous uh, job in filling these two key positions that we've been talking about. Today. Thank you. Okay, good. I'm glad that uh, my interpretation is correct. Thank you. Uh, uh, Commissioner Gilliam, I believe Ms. Antoni had some context of the nursing question. Would it be okay if she? Oh, well, yeah, that would be great. Thank right. you. Terry, please uh, jump in. I will. Thank you. Um, great. So great questions that you asked and Roland answered them beautifully that we do have charge nurses in the role that step up when they step up, they become acting managers. So the union, they can then do any sort of um, administrative detail with the um, employee. That's not an issue. We do have 3 that are, we actually have 4 currently in that role and 2 of which have um, applied for permanent jobs and we've really worked them well. And so that's. Very exciting. And in addition, we have nursing directors who can also support the units in a different way. As you're all aware, we've learned all the ways to conduct business at Laguna Honda. And these are seasoned directors that can really support the frontline staff. We are looking at the long term care list for hiring nurse managers. I know Priya said that quite eloquently. And we want long term care nurses and not med surge nurses. We want people that understand skilled nursing because that's how we're going to really make everything that we've learned over the last recertification period. Great. Thank you for that clarification, uh, Terry. Uh, I also had a question about the RN class. So, um, Priya, the uh, candidate selections for the 10 remaining positions, does that mean that? Uh, the selections have been made and mm -hmm. offers have been made and accepted. Yeah. Yeah. So that the hiring, the onboarding yes. is happening with all 10. Yes. Okay, great. So, uh, I just wanted to make sure then that we're, we're doing as well as Dr. Chow had uh, assumed in his questions. So thank you. Great work. Thank you. So can you move on commissioner? Wonderful. And, um, I just wanted to know, I see a hand from an individual who, um, I don't recognize, and I wanted to make clear again that the public comment policy is that folks um, have to contact me by 12 on Monday in order to receive accommodation to participate remotely. So I will, I don't choose, to, um, we don't acknowledge folks who have not already received accommodation. I apologize for that. Uh, let's see, we can move on to the uh, item six, the regulatory affairs report. Good evening, commissioners. Um, I'm Geraldine Noriana, Director of Regulatory Affairs. I will present the January um, 2024 Regulatory Affairs Report. For the facility reported incident, there were 14 incidents reported, and we received one anonymous complaint in January. As uh, Mr. Pickens indicated in his report, we have received the 2567 Statement of Deficiency, for our initial certification survey, as well as the fire safety and emergency preparedness during the first week of January. Um, the facility received 15 deficiencies for the initial certification survey and 12 deficiency for the fire life safety survey. There were zero findings for the emergency preparedness survey. Uh, Laguna Honda has submitted the plans of correction for the initial certification and life fire life safety surveys. Please let me know if you have any questions or comment that I can address at this time. Thank you. Geraldine, could you um, uh, verbally explain the correction that was made in the report so the commissioners and the public know what's, oh. uh, what changed? Hold on, let me just... Um, so initially, uh, we stated there that um, CDPH um, have investigated one um, investigated one um, case from the January, but it's actually two. One uh, facility reported incident, and uh, the other one is anonymous complaint. That was the revision of that initial report, commissioners. Thank you, and commissioners. We do have uh, two folks for the public comment. 
Uh, caller, you're unmuted. Please let us know that you're there. Oh, hi, it's Dr. Palmer again. Um, um, the regulatory report contains multiple um, um, ongoing allegations of abuse and years of allegations that have never been investigated by CDPH. Um, can, uh, how, how can this be? I, I mean, can, can you uh, please give us further explanation on this? Um, thank you. All right. Uh... Caller, please let us know you're there. The January Regulatory Affairs Report is troubling for a number of reasons. First, of the 14 facility reported incidents, FRIs, in January 24, 12 involved resident on resident and staff to resident abuse, despite a declining patient census of just 450 residents. There were an additional two averse events which are always alarming because they are never described publicly. Plus yet another anonymous complaint, apparently filed by someone worried about potential retaliatory actions against them. Second, the Plan of Correction, POC, update section of the report clearly states the health inspection survey component of the November 27, 2023 to December 1, 2023 inspection was for the first Medicare certification survey. That directly contradicts information LHH has previously misled the public by claiming that December inspection was being considered as a second Medicare recertification survey. So, which is it, the first or the second such survey? Finally, this report enumerates a total of 27 deficiencies identified during the November and December 2023 Medicare inspection survey. Of the 15 FTAG violations in December 13th of the 15 involved the same FTAGs that LHH was cited during RCA report number one, involving eight CDPH inspection surveys between October 14th, 2021 and April 14th, 2022, when LHH was decertified, as well as FTAG violations LHH was slapped with during the first 90-day monitoring survey in December 2022. Why does LHH continue racking up 13 additional recurring FTAC citations that happened over two years ago? LHH has had two full years to put corrective actions into place, but is still getting hit with three different types of care plan citations, disease prevention and control, medication errors, accident hazards, and worst of all failure of reporting alleged violations in a timely manner, if at all. Unfortunately, the number of FRIs pending review by CDPH climbed by 31 since December 2023 to a new total of 298 unresolved FRIs. Thank you. Thank you. That's the last comment. Okay. Uh, any questions from the, uh, members of the committee? Okay. I don't see any hands up. Can we move on? All right. Thank you. Thank you, Geraldine. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, we can move on to item seven, Laguna Honda Hospital policies. And Carmen, please, um, please mention the um, verbally the correction that was made. Thank you. Okay, no problem. So, um, good evening, Commissioners. I have twenty-seven policies today. One hospital-wide uh, hospital policies. One of them is a new policy, seventy one b four, requesting for operating under a CMS eleven thirty five waiver. There are eight revisions, uh, 2301 resident care plan, resident care team, resident care conference, 2302 completion of resident assessment instrument minimum data set, 2602 management of dysphagia and aspiration risk, 2805 custom wheelchairs, 72-01 um, B5 transmission based precautions, 71-02 C22 influenza immunization, and that's the one with the um, with the edit. Let me just pull it off. So sorry about that.
Apologies, I can't see if we can find it in the emails. Are you looking for the corrected C22? Yes, I'm looking for it. It's somewhere in my email. I'm sorry about that. I believe you you were copied on the email that Zoe sent sent it to me, the packet, and it's one of the earliest policies. Oh, sorry about that. So for um, 72 02 C22, um, the CDC issued a new advisory this year um, emphasizing that egg allergy. Uh, so they were able to reword it in the policy, um, as others have done to clarify that simple, sim simply having a history of egg allergy does not disqualify from one um, getting the flu vaccine. So they up, uh, updated the wording for that. Um, next policy is 72 01 F04 linen handling. Um, and then there's warfare and collaborative practice agreement. There are 11 deletions 24 uh, 16, appendix 13, addendum to cold blue policy during pandemic and protective quarantine 72 01 8 infection outbreak investigation and surge response 72 01. Uh, C01, alphabetical list of disease conditions with required precautions. 72-01, C20, uh, monoclonal antibody uh, therapy for COVID-19 infections. 72-01, C20, the attachment for LHH COVID uh, ban consent form. 72-01, E04, central supply materials management. 72-01, E06, dental services. 72-01 S05, standard for refrigeration equipment. 72-01 F13, attachment one, non-critical resident care equipment, uh, disinfectant exceptions. 72-01 F13, attachment two, standard work for single resident blood pressure cups. 72-07, full transmissible disease exposure uh, control plan. There are seven uh, departmental policies. The first one is central processing and uh, department. Um, there's one revision to the to their materials management and uh, central supply policy and procedures. There are three revisions for the food, food services. The first one is 1.64 preventative maintenance, 1.67 dish machine QC checklist, and 1.139 pot machine temperature checks. And there is one uh, revision for the medical services, D01-05, psychotropic medication management. And finally, there are two deletions by nursing. Uh, first one is 1.0, oral and uh, nasal pharyngeal suctioning, and 2.0, tracheal bronchial suctioning. And that is the policies for the SJCC. Thank you, Carmen. Is there a public comment? Yes, there are two hands up. Hi, right, please let us know if you're there. Hi, I didn't have a comment. I'll put my hand down. Sorry. No worries. Uh, please let us know that you're, uh, I'm sorry, wrong person. There we go. All right, please let us know that you're there. This is Patrick Monette Shaw with my last and short testimony. Why is this LHH JCC considering adopting a new LHH policy titled requesting to operate under a CMS 1135 waiver? CMS 1135 waivers are issued for several different types of contingencies and operational needs unique to any given skilled nursing facility, SNF. Why is LHH creating this new policy and for what type of operational contingency? More specifically, has LHH already submitted to CMS an application to obtain an 1135 waiver? If so, when was it submitted and for what operational need? Thank you. All right, that's the last comment. Okay, thank you. And um, I'll note that there were a number of uh, questions 
uh, from the commissioners that were answered uh, in the document that has been uh, left for us here. And so I invite uh, the members to uh, um, see if there's any additional uh, questions beyond this or any clarifications on this document that have been provided to us. Okay, Commissioner Chow. Uh, yes, uh, and I want to thank the staff for actually responding to at least a number, uh, well, a number of the, well, all the questions uh, in a very thorough manner. And and so the my question in regards to 2805, the custom wheelchairs, in which uh, it was a question of whose responsibility was it uh, in order to get them repaired, because that is a uh, uh, always a difficulty. Uh, staff has suggested that they can add nursing to alert social work department on resident custom wheelchair repairs and needs, which I think would be helpful. Uh, and and I would suggest that we add that because that's sort of lacking in the uh, policy. And it is important, I think, as we've heard in the past, that wheelchairs do need to be uh, Careful. If we're going to be checking wheelchairs and we find problems, we should be able to uh, understand the chain of command for getting it corrected. So I would uh, uh, like to suggest that that be added into the uh, protocol and anything else that's needed in order to help clarify for staff how to get a wheelchair repair. Thank you. Thank you. And I appreciate your uh, uh, revision also in the influenza immunization program. It's just going along with the CDC that says that uh, egg allergy is not a reason for not receiving the influenza vaccine now, which just came out uh, this uh, past year. Thank you. And, and Carmen, then can we uh, then be informed uh, about uh, this last one? We are going to let the uh, let uh, whoever is uh, in charge of that particular policy uh, of Dr. Chow's um, suggestion and whether that has uh, uh, led to any changes or not. Okay. Definitely. If there's any changes, I will provide the updated um, policy to Mark. Thank you. Okay. Anything else? No. Okay. So we will take a, a, a motion on approving or recommending approval of these policies to the full commission. I would move we recommend the approval with the small changes that Commissioner Chow has brought up. Is there a second? A uh, second. Elder will call vote. Commissioner Chow, how do you vote on this item? Yes. And Commissioner Green? Yes. Commissioner Guillermo? Yes. Thank you. Uh, these policies we put on the consent calendar at the next uh, for the February 20th Health Commission meeting. We can move on to item eight, which is the medical staff bylaws. Hey, Dr. Who? Hi there, commissioners. Good evening. Um, I am bringing you the revised Laguna Honda medical staff bylaws uh, for your consideration and request that we move these forward to the full health commission with your recommendation for approval. Um, I'd be happy to answer any additional questions that you have. Okay, uh, is there public comment? I see no hands up. Folks, we are on item eight. Just wanting to make sure there's no public comment for the two who have permission to do so. I see no hands. Okay. Uh, Dr. Chow, I see your hand up. Is there is that for the bylaws? Uh, I know, but I, I would like to thank staff for the responses uh, to my questions on the bylaws. Uh, very, uh, very helpful. And uh, I um, have uh, no... Uh, other questions, I think that I'm actually looking for the answers here. Uh, is uh, uh, Dr. Who, do you remember if uh, if uh, there was anything that needed to be changed in the bylaws or you were, uh, I, I, I think you clarified about the uh, question of uh, the possibility of sanction uh, and suggested that uh, the use of the term may for notification of the governing body allows discretion that uh, it has not actually happened already, but if it were really an important case, uh, I know that our uh, medical staff at uh, general has done, you would then notify us about yeah. uh, uh, the issues so that we could be aware that there was something. Uh, exactly. That gives us some discretion. So, so I, 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 I knew earlier. May. 
Thank you. And thank you for your questions. Okay, great. Uh, anything further? Okay, uh, can we have a, a oh, Dr. Green, did you, were you gonna make, oh, you're gonna make the motion? Okay, thanks. Yeah, I would move that we um, approve these uh, uh, bylaws to be sent for full approval by the Health Commission. Okay, is there a second? A second. Commissioner Shaw, how do you vote on this issue? Yes. Commissioner Green? Yes. And Commissioner Guillermo? Yes. Great, this will be put on the consent calendar for the February 20th meeting. Thank you, Dr. Hu. Uh, item you. nine is the closed session. Is there any public comment on the commission, the uh, meeting going into closed session? I see no hands. Okay, uh, you can have a motion. Move to go into closed session. Second. Second. Oh, Commissioner Chow, how do you vote on this item? Yes. Commissioner Green. Yes. And Commissioner Guillermo. Yes. All right, folks um, who are watching, uh, please uh, know that we will not be seen or heard while we're in closed session, but we, we will be back in open session before the meeting is adjourned. Thanks for attending and providing comment to those who did. And everyone else, please give me 30 seconds to, to move us over. All right, we are back in open session. Commissioners, um, Please consider a motion to disclose or not disclose um, discussions held in closed session. Move not to disclose. Second. Commissioner Chow, how do you vote on this issue? Yes. Commissioner Green? Yes. And Commissioner Guillermo? Yes. And finally, please consider a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Second. Uh, Commissioner Chow, how do you vote? Yes. Commissioner Green? Yes. And Commissioner Guillermo? Yes. Thank you, everyone. Have a lovely night.